regroup, to tell our stories again, to write and to paint and to draw and to challenge the world order and to defy censorship and to make the better world a better place. This particular edition, a very intimate, small, family uh, edition of the Goa Arts and Literature Festival is also focusing on our state language, our culture, on the fact that we are all coming back together again in Goa, find relief and warmth. And now we move to the inaugural session of this literature festival. International Centre Goa, you can see its lush environs all around. Uh, nurturing space for art, for writers, a haven of rest for visitors, travellers. Uh, good evening everyone. Uh, it's good to have everyone back after a period of about three years. Keynote speakers, Major General Jan Cardozo, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, artist Ms. Narupa Nayak, curators uh, Mr. Damodar Mauzo and Mr. Vivek Menezes, Mr. Yatin Kakotka, President of the International Centre Goa, delegates, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the International Centre Goa, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 11th edition of the Goa Arts and Literature Festival, or GALF as we simply call it. We are back after just over three years since the 10th anniversary edition was held in December 2019. GALF is organized by the International Center Goa in association with Goa Writers and with substantial support from the Government of Goa, specifically the Department of Art and Culture and the Department of Tourism. The 11th edition is unique in that it is a comeback edition, a first for GALF. We hope it will remain the only comeback edition. It is also smaller. However, what is really significant from our point of view is that GALF has survived the pandemic, and for that, the trustees of the International Center Goa must take credit, specifically the president, Mr. Kakotka. In addition, and I'll say this right now, something which has been true of for at least the last four or five editions, Mr. Kakotka has shouldered all, shouldered all the responsibility for raising the funds needed for organizing GALF. Before we move on to GALF 23, and that would be you know, starting from after I finish, let me spend a couple of minutes, a bit more maybe, to talk about the International Center Goa or ICG. The center came into existence in 1996, and the late General Sunit Rodriguez served as its first director. From the beginning, the trustees of ICG have aspired to make the institution a financially independent, non-partisan ideational center. Today, more than 25 years later, ICG is known for organizing a variety of programs, independently or in collaboration with academic institutions and other organizations. Just a short list of regular ICG programs include ICG public lectures, kitab, books and discussion, Patrakar, a forum for journalists, ICG annual lectures, which have been suspended since the pandemic, ICG discussion forum, Recent guests, that is in the last three or four months, have included Mr. Saeed Nakwi and Mr. Kiran Karnak. We at the International Center are especially proud of three flagship programs which we have started in the last few years, which is one, ICG Annual Scholars and Residence Program, ICG Annual Research Grants Competition, and an ICG Annual Conference which we started last year and which we have hoped to continue this year as well. The research grants competition, uh, since in the last three years, has supported research on nutrition security in Goa and on dating violence and mental health among young people. This year, we have awarded the research grants to a Bangalore-based scholar, a young scholar, for his research on fiscal challenges facing India's small states with a focus on Goa and Sikkim. You just have to go back to yesterday's headlines in the Navin Times to see how relevant this topic is. In 2019, we started our Scholars in Residence program. The awardee, Mr. Thomas Manuel, his book, Opium Inc., 
went on to be published with HarperCollins in 2021. In 2020, we awarded the grants to Abhishek Chaudhary, Mr. Abhishek Chaudhary and Ms. Amrita Shah. Just two weeks ago, Abhishek Chaudhary's 1,000-page biography of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the former Prime Minister of India, was picked up by Pan Macmillan and it will come out as a 1,000-page book, first in two volumes and subsequently in one combined volume in 2023. In 22-23, we'll have three excellent writers, Mr. Dinesh Sharma, Ms. Neeta Deshpande, and Mr. Samrat Chaudhary as ICG's Scholar-in-Residence. ICG has more than 2,400 individual members and 30-plus institutional members, including several academic institutions. Three IITs at Goa, Bombay, and Roorkee, Goa University, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, Ahmedabad University, and others. We especially, we especially welcome women and men of letters, academic institutions, writers' associations, and other similar organizations to apply for membership. The 11th edition of GALF is co-curated for the 11th time by Mr. Mauzo and Mr. Menezes. They deserve praise for their insistence on a comeback edition. And now on to the thank yous. On behalf of ICG, I would like to thank our festival partners, Goa Writers, the Directorate of Art and Culture, Government of Goa. Thank you, Ms. Nirupa Nayak, for preparing the official GALF 2023 artwork. Thanks are also due to our sponsors, donors, and volunteers without whom this festival would not be possible. What a great job Jose is doing. Thank you for handling this important role once again this year. Some may not know this, ladies and gentlemen, but Jose is one of the best literary minds of Goa and one of my very favorite short story writers. His book is on sale above. A big hand, please, for Jose Lorenzo. <laughs> Dear General Cardoz, Dr. Banerjee, Nirupa, Pushkar, Yatin, and Bhai. Dear friends, this is a festival that the 11th edition of a festival that was started 13 years ago, but this is my first time speaking at the inaugural, which is at the insistence of our co-curator, my be our beloved Nyan Pit Award winner, Damodar Mauzo, or Bhai, as we all lovingly refer to him. And it is beautiful. I'm trying to take in as much as possible today. What is happening today with these kinds of distinguished delegates and guests assembled from so many places was actually kind of impossible to imagine when Bhai and I started to conceive of this event along with the ICG and its then director and then later with the stalwart support of Yatin Kakodkar. Tourism back then, not so long ago but it seems like a long time, tourism was starting to grow explosively in our beautiful little state. But nonetheless, Goa was routinely treated as a cultural backwater by the powers that be. When they talked, and to, let's admit to a large extent, when they still talk about Goa, it is as though it's some kind of kitschy, exotic periphery with some rustic, folksy charm and, you know, eccentric people who you can't really compute in a one-dimensional way. Certainly very far from what is the mainstream culture of our great country. We are told that big writers and big books, maybe they will come from the Hindi heartland. Certainly they will come from the grand Bengali tradition of Dr. Banerjee, London, New York, South Bombay, but not Goa. Our great Goan laureate, and who is a constant inspiration for this festival, I'm so pleased to see Nirupa put, has put her words on this painting, beautiful painting, thank you Nirupa. Eunice D'Souza, who's an inspiration for this festival, put it typically acerbically. My students think it's funny that Daruwalas and D'Souza's should write poetry. Poetry is fairy lands forlorn. Women writers miss Austin. Only foreign men air their crotches. Eunice, how I miss her. But here's the thing, as writers know best of all, and so do economists like Dr. Banerjee, the conventional wisdom is almost invariably wrong, misguided, and turned on its head by the facts of life as we really know and live them. 
the astonishing cultural history of this ancient slice of the Konkan coastline, which encompasses General Cardoz and Mustansir Dalvi and Raman Abbas and Yatin Kakoutkar and myself and Mr. Ramat Khan Khalap, this astonishing cultural history of this ancient slice of the Konkan coastline, and indeed the entire Konkan and Malabar coastlines and the west coast of India, almost always falls entirely out of the broad strokes depictions and portrayals of Indian history, Indian culture, and Indian identity. In my opinion, it is a great loss, partly for us, but mostly for India itself. We know that this ancient island of Tiswadi, Dr. Banerjee, the ancient island of Tiswadi where we are on right now has been connected profoundly to the world for at least 3,000 years. And possibly earlier than that, a full thousand years to the Sumerians. We know that over a thousand years ago, the Karamba kings, who very close to this point had, a, had their ancient kingdom, had their ancient capital, had the cosmopolitan foresight to appoint an Arab chief minister. This is a thousand years ago. General Cardoz and I, General Cardoz is one of the greatest raconteurs I've met in my life. In a short period of time, he's told me three amazing stories. But General Cardoz and I were talking about this earlier. Our ancestors have navigated long eras of peace, peaceful coexistence that are almost unparalleled. The colonial period did begin with a brief bloodbath, but Alfonso of the Albuquerque's men decapitated the previous rulers, leaving the natives largely unscathed. They persisted and flourished and embraced the world and have held on to their homeland too. Another great laureate of this land, Bakibab Borkar, put it most beautifully some 50 years ago. Tribals, Dravidians, Aryans, Assyrians, Sumerians, they all settled in this territory through the course of several centuries. But Goa's scenic beauty humanized them all so insistently and efficiently that they amalgamated into a single society with one common language and one cultural heritage. The kinship and cooperation forged un unto them by the aesthetic impact of Goa's rich scenery taught them the art of living in peace and friendship and inspired them to strive for nobler ideals. That is the Goans. It is not what you recognize being filtered through Bollywood or through our own various scenes. This is the Goans. This is the backdrop to the festival. We are beginning anew this beautiful January evening in the river breeze. These days we are being told very often what is Indian and who is Indian. But if you ask me, this is the best that India can be and the rest of India should be more like us. Wow. Dear friends, a couple of weeks ago I was privileged to represent us all stroke of miraculous luck at the Dhaka Literature Festival, a pulsating, extraordinary event held in an almost apocalyptic atmosphere that was both shattering and incredibly thrilling at the same time. We have an eyewitness here, Ifat Nawaz, the wonderful Bangladeshi novelist, was here and confirmed these things. They happened almost two weeks ago in a, another part of the South Asia that is almost unrecognizably different from what we're experiencing here. But in there, in that crucible, I spent some time every day talking about the Indian Ocean world and Zanzibar and East Africa and of course the East African Goans with the most ne recent Nobel Prize winner for literature, the distinguished novelist Abdul Razak Gorna, who promised me that he will attend GALF the next time if we invite him. As this wonderful gentleman and I expanded our exchange, little bits of conversation spread out over many days in very pleasant company. He kept on viewing and analyzing the world and discussing it through the prism of Zanzibar. And he always said again and again to me, Zanzibar is very small, but it's important. It's such a terrific place, a terrific prism for him to view, view human existence that he created one of the great herbs of our time from it. Friends, Goa is also small but it is equally important. Just look around the lawn, these lawns, and feel the moment, and you know it's true. Thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee, for coming and blessing this occasion. Thank you so much, Major General Ian Cardoz, 
Major General Ian Cardoz has never been invited to Goa to be celebrated as the Goan hero. We, Gulf has done it first. I feel humbled at this opportunity. <laughs> On behalf of our Bhai, Damodar Mauzo, and the rest of our Goa Writers Group, Jose, many others, I'd like to sincerely thank the International Center and most especially Yatan Kakotkar, who has absolutely made it happen. As well as Pushkar, Nilima, Teja, the entire team for bringing, for bringing our baby back, back from limbo. Welcome to GALF. Dignitaries in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, it is a delight to be back in Goa after so many years and to be given the privilege of delivering this keynote address. I must confess that this is the first keynote address that I am giving and I hope I will come up to your expectations. Commenting on what the earlier speakers said, uh, we in the army do not have much time for people who write. And I always wanted to write, but they looked down upon us as paper tigers. And so I had to start writing only after I retired. But it has been wonderful, a wonderful world to write about. There is so much to write about and so little time. I wondered as to what I should say at this keynote address. It sounds so very serious and I'm not a very serious person. And then I was told you could talk about the Goa that you knew over 80 years ago, that's nearly a century ago. And I said, okay. That being so, I thought I should share with you my experiences of Goa of nearly a century ago. In those years, it was in the summer holidays that we, Bombay Goikas, used to come to Goa every April and May. In fact, not only the Bombay Goikas, but Goikas from all over the world used to focus on coming and spending time in their ancestral home. It was a royal homecoming. We who had settled in Bombay used to travel by ship and it was our preference to travel on the San Anton. It was called an ark boat, fire boat. And we used to get on board and stake our place on the deck with our daris. And out would come the guitars and the mandolins and the smuggled booze. And the trip from Bombay to Goa used to be a song fest all the way till we finally went to sleep with the noise of the ship's engines giving us a lullaby. There was no bridge on the Mandovi at that time and we used to travel to Beti with a, on a gasoline, a ferry run on gasoline. And when we reached the other side, we were put into a, a taxi called a camion and then we reached Kanduli, my hometown. We had a wonderful villa there and our house was called Motokuris. It was in the boundaries of Baman Wado and Dando. I understand that a big hotel has come up there now and I feel very sad to know that our house doesn't exist anymore. In the go of those days, there was no electricity, so no lights, no fans or refrigerators. For lights, we used lanterns and what was those days called ponties, improvised lamps. Being very close to the sea, the breeze from the sea kept us cool. And a line of storerooms at the back of the house had earthen pots hanging from the rafters, which had khara, parra, 
pickles, and on the floor, coconuts and firewood, for in those days our food was cooked on wood fires. The kitchen was our favorite room. It used to be filled with the beautiful aroma of Marianne's beautiful cooking. Marianne was our caretaker. And before we arrived, she would make sure that there were cakes of mangal and bibik waiting for us and pickles of every sort. Food was cooked on chulas that were fed with wood, which were basically dry fronds with coconut trees that grew around our house. Part of the kitchen housed the bathroom. Now the bathroom was just a wall with a small square window and at the side there was a huge metal container called a band and there used to be a girl to put in the corso in the barn and hand it over to us through the aperture and we used to have a hot bath. And I understand that goans all over the world, irrespective of the weather, are used to having hot baths. <laughs> we had our own well, part of which was in the kitchen and part of which was outside so that others could use it also. Dinner was had in the kitchen, but before that, Dad would give us a small glass filled with kajel, with sugar and hot water. Dinner was followed by rosary in Konkani, along with Marianne and the servants. And I still remember the sonorous cadence of the Our Father and the Hail Mary in Konkani, which had us nodding off to sleep. Early next morning, we would don our swimming costumes and run out of the back door onto the beach to play on its gleaming white sands. At one end of the beach, Kandoli, was Sinkeri Hill, Fort Agwad, and the lighthouse. And at the bottom of Sinkeri was a lovely warm spring where we used to bathe. The other side of Kandoli stretched to Kalangut and Baga. The beach was empty, except for us and the fishermen, who used to cast their nets in a unique way. And it was so exciting to see the fish jumping in those nets. Often. The waves would throw lines of sardines onto the shore and all we had to do was run along and pick them up before the next wave picked them back into the sea. Fish was so plentiful that we used to use it as manure. On return from the beach, we used to wash away the sand at the well before having a hot bath. Food in Goa was outstanding, but breakfast was a bit of a disaster. We were forced to eat pears Kanji, and which we didn't like, but was told, it's good for you, so you have it. Goa those days was duty free. Scotch whiskey, masiara brandy was just six rupees a bottle, and everything was dirt cheap. In fact, I remember seeing mugs, that is, Mercedes Benz being used as taxis in Panjim and Margaon. I could go on and on, but that would be at the risk of boring you. However, what I wanted to share with you was a Goa of long ago, a Goa I remember, a different Goa of what it was then and what it is now. It is the Goa of scintillating beaches, wide open spaces, swaths of coconut trees and mango groves, kaju plants grew wild at the back of the house. It was a Goa of different aromas, particularly the rooms at the back of the house, which stored the parra, the kara, the pickles and the mounds of coconuts from our trees, of sounds of the waves that crashed on the shore, of the hens about to lay eggs, of the poder with his cycle, with his pom-pom, and the squealing pig being taken off for the slaughter. <laughs> I don't know whether those sights and sounds and aromas exist in today's Goa, but we have to accept Goa for what it is, because that's where we belong. This fest and the earlier ones, I believe, are based on the concept of belonging. Belonging to our beloved Goa. Coming back to our sense of identity and belonging, I think my own family played an important part in taking part, taking Goan music, dance, language and culture to the rest of India. My mother's sister's husband, Professor Ancha Lobo, Anton Xavier, founded along with other eminent Goans from Bombay, the Goan Folk Song and Choral Society during the war years and stage performances all over India. My mother, her sisters and my older cousins 
took part in these performances, which included the bando, the dakni, the kumbi wedding scenes, and scenes celebrating our fisher folk and the church. The Goan Folk Song and Choral Society projected Goa on India's first Republic Day with the Kumbi wedding on the Rajpath in Delhi. It was the same Professor Ancho Lobo who composed the music for Sahare Jahan Se Acha, Hindustan Hamara, which is still played during the every beating of the retreat in Delhi. All this brought me to understand that belonging has various levels of identity, family, home, school, college, community, state, institutions, and country. And I'm not sure whether Goans realize that to be truly Goan, one needs to break out from the boundaries of Goanness to being citizens of India and the world. Goa has excelled in every profession and in every human endeavor. And it will be selfish to confine them to the boundaries of Goa and that their work but their work to be properly acknowledged, accepted and, and recognized, we Goans need to be identified as citizens of India and the world. <clears throat> my grandfather on the, my mother's side, Philip Vincent de Souza, established the Anglo Luzutan in Bombay and the ILI Hall for Goans to celebrate their various events. I wonder if Anyone amongst you remembers the Lusitanians, the famous hockey team of the Goans? My father played for them, my uncles played for them. And I wonder if you remember Neville de Souza. Neville de Souza was the person who scored a hat trick at Melbourne in the Olympics. And yeah, and he was uh, mentioned on Amitabh Bachchan's show. And the, and the answer to the question of who scored a hat trick at Melbourne from India and the, the, the participant didn't know the answer. It would, he would have fetched one, thousand, one crore of rupees. It was Neville de Souza. And Neville's father, Jose, was the first goalkeeper of the Lusitanians and the Goans in Bombay before Leo Pinto and Sakru Manesis. His uncles played Nelson and Suryako, my dad, Vincent, my uncle, Johnny D'Souza, all played for the Lusitanians. We played their hearts out for Goa because that's where we belonged. That was the sense of belonging and they went to do their best. I would like here to tell you an interesting story about an individual who was our servant in the house. He was a rabid Goan. Everything Goa was exceptionally good. There was could be no fault with anything going. And I used to play for the Lusitanians B team before I played for my school hockey. And we were one day playing at the BPHA before the main match. And the people, it was a, it was a key match and there was a huge crowd already there when we went in to play our match. But the goalie didn't come. The goal was empty. And suddenly I got a shout from the stands. Bob, Aoyata, Bob, Aoyata. It was João, our cook. And he dodged through everybody and reached me, panting and said, Sir, Bob, let me play in the goal. So I went to the referee and I said, uh, we don't have a goalkeeper, can he play? He said, is his name on the team? I said, no. But the, the crowd was getting restive and they were quite excited by this, what was happening. And they were shouting and cheering. So the referee said, okay, you put his name down, let him play. So Joao played in the goal. <laughs> I said to him, pad up, use your pad, use a protective gear. Bob, naka, I don't want, I will play without anything. I said, you'll get hurt, doesn't matter. And Joao played his heart out. He saved every ball that went into the, he didn't allow the ball to enter the goal. And the crowd was in raptures, they were cheering him all the time. And the next day, although there was a big match which was which was uh, followed us, nothing about them appeared. It was only Joao and a photograph of him in the goal. He was hurt all over. His shins, his, his torso, his hands. Luckily, he got no serious injury. But that is what 
Goa is all about. That is what Goan is all about. This is what we feel about Goa. We, he played his heart out and I think he will never remember, he will never forget this to the end of his days, neither can I. As an officer of the Indian Army, I learned that I belonged to a bigger family and a bigger cause. Lines of caste, community and creed had to become blurred in order to belong to a higher and greater identity. In the Indian Military Academy, we learned country always came first and that included the people of India. That the soldiers we commanded came next and our own needs as soldiers came last always and every time. We were taught that to belong, the following are very important. Love. Now, I, I don't know what you think about a soldier being associated with love, but it is on the altar of love that men and women in uniform put their lives on the line of fire and disappear in the smoke and fire of battle. Love for the country, love for the people of India, love for our soldiers, love for the regiment, and love for the way of life which has no equal. The next important value that we learned was honor. <clears throat> honor is the value from which everything else flows. And I'd like to tell you a couple of stories about love, honor, personal example. Personal example comes from leadership. The army is all about leadership. And leadership falls on very young sh shoulders of very young officers who lead from the front. They do not say, they say, Mere piche move. In other words, follow me. And that's what the army is all about. And the soldier, the Indian soldier, the best in the world, and I hope it continues to be the best in the world with all these problems of Agni Patan, Agni Veer and all that. But Without doubt, the Indian soldier is the best in the world. And he follows his officers, his young tigers, because he knows that they are right in front, facing the maximum fire and the maximum danger. My own battalion, the 4th Battalion, the 5th Gurkha Rifles, entered the war in 1971 with 18 officers. Only seven survived in a 13-day war. Four got killed, seven got badly wounded. Only seven survived. That is the price that we have to pay for the service and security of our country. Duty and commitment, sacrifice. I would like to illustrate this by a couple of stories. One of them is the Battle of Dograi. Trijat was led by a Lieutenant Colonel Desmond Haid, Mahavir Chakra. When he was a captain and I was a gentleman cadet in the IMA, he taught us, he said, battles are won or lost on the ground before, sorry, battles are won or lost in the mind before they are won or lost on the ground. And he proved that in Dograi. He was given a task to capture Dograi across the Ichogil Canal. His battalion, the 3rd Jat, captured Dograi at great cost and went on beyond Dograi, an infantry battalion on foot, 11 miles beyond Dograi on the outskirts of Lahore at a place called Batapur. But the brigade could not link up with them and yet to come back. They were very, very upset. They said, getting us back is a slur on the honor of our battalion. And when Dograi had to be captured again, they volunteered to be in the vanguard. They said, we will capture Dograi again. And Lieutenant Colonel Desmond Head 
whose ancestors were from Ireland, who spoke Hindi with an accent, but who, who spoke Haryanbi like a jat, addressed the troops and said, we are going to capture Dograi again. Many of you will die. Many of you will be wounded. And if I die, I want you to take my body to Dograi tomorrow morning because that's where I want to be. Where will we be tomorrow morning? And the whole battalion rode Dograi and they captured Dograi again. Amazing because uh, the Pakistani battalion which was holding Dograi, a battalion consists of a thousand men, a brigade consists of three battalions, over three thousand men. The battalion holding Dograi was decimated. 897 bodies were counted, but they themselves suffered very severe casualties. So that's, this is what the army is all about. Honor, love, sacrifice, commitment, duty, discipline. And then I'll take you to the 71 war. I was still in staff college when my posting to a staff appointment was cancelled and I was sent to my battalion because the second in command had, was killed and I was to replace him. The battalion was given a task to capture an objective called Atkaram. And we came from a counterinsurgency area. Now, the army in counterinsurgency areas does not use heavy weapons, so they had no artillery. So we were going into attack. Normally, in an attack, you use heavy artillery to keep the enemy's head down. We had no artillery. So the CO said, okay, we are Kurkas. And as someone said earlier, we use the kukri. The kukri is a, uh, the, the battle kukri is about, has a blade of about 14 to 16 inches, very sharp, curved. And he said, we will launch a kukri attack at midnight, catch the enemy by surprise. And we launched the last kukri attack in modern military history. And that moonlight night, Pakistani heads rolled. Kukris were used with abandon. And those Pakistanis who survived ran back and told their, their comrades, don't mess with the Gurkhas because you're liable to lose your head. <laughs> so this is what happened in the first battle. A battalion fought three battles in 13 days. The problem with the army, any army in the world is, if you do well, you get more and more difficult tasks. And then we were told to go and capture Ghazipur, another enemy stronghold. And we had to capture Ghazipur because another battalion could not capture it. It had failed its task. And the core commander, General Sakat Singh, one of the finest strategic commanders of the world, said, send in the Gurkhas. I know they will do the job. And we captured Ghazipur, but at a great cost. So uh, by this time, we had lost three officers killed, four officers wounded, but we captured Ghazipur. And now the CO thought, okay, I think I need to reorganize the battalion. So many people have been killed, officers have been killed. And he asked for four days rest so that he could reorganize the battalion and put people in the right place. And he was hardly settling down and the battalion, the men were going to get their first hot meal in about seven days when the co commander heard mistakenly that the brigade, that is three battalions, the brigade, Pakistani brigade, holding Silet, had moved for the defense of Dhaka. And he said, Silet is empty, I want them to be, to be captured immediately. Send in the Gurkhas. So the CEO said, is this the only battalion in the corps? Why can't somebody else be given this task? No, only you can do it. And so, to cut a long story short, we launched India's first heliborne attack. And we were promised that we would be reinforced within 48 hours. That never happened. 
assume possibly knew that this reinforcement would not happen. So he talked to the JSUs and the men and he said, uh, I don't think we can be reinforced. So instead of carrying food and water we will and, and uh, bedding, we will carry more ammunition and grenades. And the men readily agreed. And that's what stood us in good stead. The battalion fought for nine days and nine nights. I was with them at that time. I was the second in command. Without food, without water, but less ammunition. What we didn't know, that the brigade had not left Silet. It was still there. So it was a ratio of one is to six. What made things worse is another brigade had reinforced Silet. So now there were two brigades and the, and the Silet garrison, which meant they were now nearly 8,000 troops and our strength was 384. But we fought them till the end. Luckily, BBC, we, the Indian government did a great thing. We had nothing to hide. So we allowed foreign correspondents to march with the troops, to eat with the troops, to sleep alongside. And they were reporting things as they happened. And the world got absolutely authentic information, minute to minute. The correspondent made a mistake and said, a brigade of Gurkhas has landed at Silet. We were not even half a battalion. So we pretended to be a brigade. And to cut a long story short, the bluff worked. <laughs> Finally, on the 10th on the tenth, tenth day, two officers from Pakistan came with white flags. And the CEO said, tell them to stop, not to come any closer, because he was worried they had come to know how, how, how little we were on the ground. And he said, we want to surrender. The CEO said, I have no orders to accept your surrender. Go back and continue the fight. <laughs> then they said, can we speak to the brigade commander? Then we knew that our bluff had worked. So he said, come back tomorrow at the same time. We'll talk to the brigade commander. So the brigade commander came the next day in a helicopter and the Pakistani said, who has come in this helicopter? He said, I have. Said, but you're the brigade commander, aren't you here? He said, no, where are you? I'm a hundred miles away. Then what is here? Only a battalion and that too, half a battalion. They couldn't believe what was being told to them. And we got the biggest shock of our lives because three brigadiers, two full colonels, 170 officers, 290 JCOs, 8,000 men surrendered to us. We were just 352. <laughs> so this is what belonging is all about. Eunice Souza has made belonging a part of our heritage as a goal lift fest. And belonging, we need to take belonging to a different different level. We have great goals doing great things for India. Can we be selfish and keep them within the limits and boundaries of Goa or can they go and and their names and their achievements to be become known worldwide. To typ typify what I've just said, I'd like to give you a few quotes about the army. No one understands the value of life unless you have lived in the shadow of death. This is what the army is all about. Battles are won in the mind, lost or won in the mind before they are lost on the ground. This applies to all of us, to every walk of life. Helen Keller, life is an adventure or it is nothing. And Abraham Lincoln who said, do not count the years in your life, instead consider the life in your years. 
belief in God is very important. The Indian Army is very spiritual. We believe, we, we respect all religions. We respect unity and diversity. We have, in mixed units, we have Gurdwara, Girijar, the uh, temple, mandir, all co-located, all in one place all together. I, as a Christian, go to the mandir on Sunday because it's a parade. That's the men of, religion of my men. And then I go to my church because that is my religion and that's where I belong. And belief in God is important for the soldier because when he launches his attack with a war cry on his lips, he has God in his heart. And all of us need to have God in our hearts because, and our prayers, because we need India to be what it was all these years and in the future also. Unity and diversity is important. That we must never forget. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Kavite Chanao Thug Kudkudecha Thandim Kaiza Gothelat Sagri Tari Te Dukani Shipta Tek Anant Bhui Patsvitsar Ektaiun Te Kantat Kattamati Itlia and Ititlia in Zachi Poker Chati Te Gaita Sadkita Naketranji Zanja Payang Chir Pallat Naktau Kalat ते त्या नाकठाऊ इली माती खरवडून काढीत असत ते बी शिपटतात फायची पण भेटड्या काळांकडे पावना कायच फाजिल टीव्ही सांगिना ती काणी फाजिल पेटारे भेटे कान पोजडी तोणा खडून काढतात फार चाकू तलवारी बाउटे फटिंग आणि तोपता दरकता हे सर तळतार तांच्या ते अशेच करीत आयल्यात माती एक कोण म्हणीत आयल्यात Puntari Anantatli Bhui Ani Bhuitli Ananta Bolge Ektai Kurta Sapnat Konacha Majai Sapnat Mati Eta Halisari Ani Pore Trauta Maka Doyan Dore Halun Shabda Girun Moon Tukta Majayang Thundagar Zata Moritz Tendahau Kavite Zotha Geta Warmth. In this bitter cold, all hearts freeze. Yet, with tears they water an infinite land, lush green. Together they plough the parched soil, broad chests hollow within. They sing songs of the stars. They who sweat, they with blistered feet, draw out soil from broken nails. They sprinkle seeds of tomorrow, but nothing reaches the deaf ears. Idiot boxes, deaf ears, nasty faces, unsheathed swords, knives and guns, fake flags, appear deep till palms bleed. Habitual occurrence it is, where soil becomes sludge, yet this limitless land and her infinity gather strength in dreams. In my dreams of late, I see soil refusing to drop its case. Like cops, I freeze. Then, in poetry, I find warmth. I find relief. Thank you. Dear Welcome. Both my friend Vivek Menezes and uh, G General Cardoso are amazing speakers, and I'm not, um, in, and I know that. Uh, so it's going to be, this, this is the time when you can take your nap before the um, real action begins. Um, 
uh, interestingly, um, Jose was very kind to men mention many of our books. The book I actually uh, want to talk about is a book from 2011 called Poor Economics. It was a, it, it was a attempt that Esther Duflo and I made to, uh, at that point, about this 2009-2010, and in fact we wrote a substantial part of it in Goa. Um, that's why I thought it was an appropriate book to, um, to come back to. And it was a book with a, where, where we were trying to think about, you know, what's poverty about, where does it come from, and what do you do about it? And that's, that, that's, it's, a, it's a book that um, I guess has uh, sold many more than any of our other books and, and um, has been translated into many, many languages. Um, I just saw the Malayalam translation. I'm, I'm waiting, waiting for the Konkani translation of that book. So the point of that bo book, um, and I'm, I, mean, I, don't, I mean that not, um, it's not entirely facetious. I would love to have an excuse to come back here. I'm so grateful to be invited to this festival. It's, uh, it's, I, I, I don't belong here, but when I come back, I've been here many times. I do feel that I've left a little piece of my heart here, so coming back is always a little sentimental, and I'm, I'm privileged to be able to have done that. In, so what, what I want to talk about today is, as I said, about that book, but not so much that book as much as what, uh, what, we, what we've learned about that same question. Where, what, where does poverty come from, and what do you do about it? And those are very related questions, of course. Over the last, since we wrote that book, so almost you know, 12 years from then, or actually more than that, since we started writing it in 2010. So it, what, what, what did we learn since then? And what, 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 um, what, the, what picture of the sort of poverty and what, you know, and policies that have to do with it uh, can we build out of what we've learned? What, what, I, what I want to do is, I mean, there's just there are many, obviously, with any, any, any book, or any, there's many ideas there. I, I thought I would organize this in terms of, I think, a number of the, I think, maybe uh, two tempting propositions about the lives of the poor. The ones you hear a lot, and um, as, as Vivek mentioned, uh, part of what we try to do is to overturn uh, cliches. And so we, let me start with a set of cliches about the uh, lives of the poor. And I'm going to basically start, uh, go through one at a time, um, discuss, telling you what, what we've learned sort of around that cliche. So one, the first cliche I think, and maybe the most dangerous one, is that the poor are poor because they're unproductive, because they just are not able to be uh, able to produce. So in some sense, of course, that's, um, you know, if they could produce, a, uh, you know, a build a Tesla and sell it, they would be rich. But that's sort of the wrong question. It's the question is, is it are they intrinsically uh, unproductive, or is it the case that they are the that to be productive, even if you have all the talent in the world, you need something else. You need investments, you need opportunities, you need <coughs> connections, you need friends, you need security, you need the confidence. And maybe all of those things are hard to have if you're poor. In other words, m maybe the, the ultimate cause of poverty is poverty. Poor people are poor because they start poor, because their parents were poor, they, because they were plunged into poverty be, before, before they had a, any option and stayed there. Uh, the reason why that, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a view that in economics is sometimes called a poverty trap. Poor poverty is the explanation for poverty. Um, the, the reason uh, that's uh, important is that in some sense, maybe once you recognize that it could be a trap, what, what's exciting is the possibility of unraveling. If po poor people are poor because they are poor, 
then maybe if you make them a little less poor, they would no longer stay poor. Because they, if they're trapped, can you spring the trap? That's a question uh, in, our, in poor economics. Uh, we had posed that question, but really with not much of a sense of what the answer would be. In many ways, I, I think uh, if you can ever, if you ever ever write a book where everything in that book is true, it's probably not an interesting book. So we were setting out to say things which were potentially interesting, potentially false, uh, and as I tell you, as we will go, we'll, I'll tell you some of the things we said were false. But in any case, we asked the question: Is it true that poor people are poor because they are poor? Is it the case that if you spring them from the trap, you actually will uh, they will keep going and you know uh, keep diverging? Uh, from other people, what, what would happen if you spring them from a trap? So, the, when uh, and this was uh, in the days when we didn't really have enough evidence on this question. Um, the way uh, the work that we were awarded the Nobel Prize for is largely uh, work of randomized controlled trials. What we do is we conduct large scale, large scale means often millions of people, but sometimes only thousands uh, or many hundreds of uh, people. And the idea is if you choose two groups or many groups uh, at, at random from that population and you give them different opportunities or different options and you compare them, you s because you've chosen a random, those groups are the same. And because they're the same, you can compare them, and you can, and you can therefore learn what what the true difference is. So that idea, which is the same idea as a as a drug trial, but it conducted at an enormously larger scale. Drug trials have 60 people. We often have 13 million. So it's a different kind of exercise. But nonetheless, same idea it g g often gives you a reliable answer to the question: What is it that um, uh, what is it that the effect of a particular intervention is. The particular intervention I want to mention is an intervention that was conducted, actually, there was, it existed, it was invented by a Bangladeshi NGO called BRAC. And the intervention is called the Ultra Poor Program, uh, or what they call targeting the hardcore poor. The idea, the idea was that there are people, or I think, Back actually called it the graduation program. And the idea was that you graduate from extreme poverty into normal poverty. These were people who were, who were often women who had never worked, who had been abandoned, or her husbands were alcoholics or had, had died, and who had young children and had never worked, never earned a living, who were typically living by getting arms from people. Can you take those people and turn them into productive citizens? And their idea was, what we're going to do is we're going to, of course, asking them to take a loan. Nobody's going to give them a loan. But we could ask them to give them a gift. A gift meaning you typically a cow, several goats, maybe a, maybe a, a little bag of trinkets to sell. And we tell them, well, you know, do, do your best. And there's someone around to encourage them to keep doing that. This was the intervention they had pioneered. And we studied that actually in seven countries at the same time, in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in, in Peru, in Ghana, in Ethiopia, in Honduras. And the point of studying them was to look, is it really the case that suppose I take these people who are the poorest of the poor, do we give them something? If these people are really incapable of being productive, well, that's not going to change anything. They will, you know, it's still, it's a, it's a, it's a ca asset. Maybe it's worth a couple of hundred dollars, but it, that's it. And it, you know, over the many years, that's that's not much money. So it's not going to do anything. What we found, and we've been tracking them now for many years. Ten years later, the people who got these assets are still 25 percent richer. They kept going, and they kept going not with the cow which they eventually sold and they started a business. And then with the business, they made money and they send their children. You can see still a difference. These are, remember, these are randomized groups, group, so they're identical. Ten years later, you see them, their children now who were 
10 then, or 20 now, they send them further away. They're working in Goa rather than Kolkata. This, uh, the, the intervention was in West Bengal. Uh, the control group, the people who didn't get the intervention, the children work nearby. They're working in jobs. The, the children of the people who got the intervention, they have the confidence, the resources, the, maybe the connections to send their children further. So they're in Goa, they're in Surat, they're in Ahmedabad. So their lives were transformed by this intervention. They did not just, you know, sell the cow and take the money and have a party and get it get, finish and fall back into poverty. I think that's, and we see this in Pakistan, we see this in Bangladesh, very similar evidence in Bangladesh, which also tracked for many years. We see this in Peru. And it's, in a sense, I would say, the first point to be made is that there's talent everywhere. People, people are able to be productive. If they're not productive, it's because they don't get opportunities. The flip side of that, which we all, all or the very related question, another strong prejudice that is around is you know so once I say you know if you give people some some help like this they will be able to sustain themselves they'll get richer the next question the you immediately get this other um, you know this murmur well but you know if you give people things they'll become lazy you know you can't give people things you have to make them earn it but it's an empirical question it's, it's, you know, it's not a, it's not about, you know, we can, all the wisdom about human nature, I'm afraid, doesn't answer most of these questions. We can have all, we can, we, we can quote all the experts and, you know, uh, read, um, you know, whatever, Nietzsche and, and the Bhagavad Gita, but we'll, eventually I think we need to look at the data. Uh, and when we look at the data, what is remarkably tr tr clear is that, and we now looked at randomized control trials, I think something like um, 15 of them across the world, but in each case, people were given a free income or a free, free, free asset, and we look at what happens. In every case, the ma main point is that nothing happens, either nothing happens to labor supply, they don't work less, they don't work more, in many cases, they, nothing changes, they continue to work as much as they were working, making them any richer doesn't make them lazy. Or in some specific cases, they be actually become more productive. They become more confident because they are, they feel a little bit more value, they feel a little less depressed, and they actually undertake harder tasks. So in other words, yes, we can help people. People are capable, and yes, we can help them. So let me start. So those. Are so a third, again, very related prejudice is that, you know, you know, this education, yeah, it's, it's great. Yesterday the Asar results came out. Asar is a, is actually a unique Indian inter invention. It's in a, a, Pratham, which is an NGO here, invented the idea that you could actually measure results, you know, the performance in education district by district in India without using professionals, by using volunteers, and you can do it at a scale. They, they, yesterday they released their results, annually they do it. There were 700,000 kids who were tested in 618 districts. Uh, and from, I mean, that's an, uh, that's an exercise that other countries have now imitated, but we invented it. We, we sort of don't credit, take credit for the things that we really do well. We invented it. That particular survey yesterday, unfortunately, then revealed what uh, the depressing result that, you know, we have recovered a little bit from the pandemic. It was really bad in 2021, but uh, overall, we're still behind 2018. And even in 2018, those things weren't that great. Things were really um, pretty mediocre. We, 30, uh, a third of all children in, in class five can really do class two level math. The rest can't. And that's a number that should shock all of us. And then when you have that, you immediately get people saying, well, maybe, oof, you know, the schools are bad, that there's no infrastructure, we need boards, we need computers, 
we need um, uh, we need um, better paid teachers. Uh, the teachers need, to, and and uh, all of those things seem plausible. And one of the things we we had written about again in 2011 was the fact that in fact there was relatively little evidence that any of these things work. And since then, unfortunately, all of those statements have been proved true. I, that's, I'm, I don't want you to think that I'm going to go away from this point thinking that I'm saying nothing works, but just hold your breath. Um, so in, tw in tw 2011, uh, we had a sort of had evidence with randomized control trials of blackboards, randomized tr control trials of uh, other um, school infrastructure, different kinds. And indeed, infrastructure is not unimportant. If there's no school, you cannot have learning. You can't learn. Uh, uh, I mean, there is sentimental and romantic beliefs about what you can do on your cell phone, but mostly we saw from the pandemic that once there is no school, children don't learn. They fall back. So, so you need a building. But I think the basic fact now from many more studies since in the last 10 years is that infrastructure doesn't matter so much, nor does um, really in very little evidence for, you know, teacher pay. There's a wonderful uh, randomized control trial in Indonesia, a very large one, where teacher salaries were doubled, and nothing happened to test scores. Um, so none of those things matter. So the, and in other words, the children are not learning, and they're not learning because of the sort of these expensive things that you can't can you put in the school. So when you say that to people, they say, well, maybe, oh, Maybe, maybe it's really that they can't learn. Maybe it's just these children, they're, you know, they were, they're malnutrited. They didn't get, uh, you know, they didn't get to eat in the, when they were in the, in the, enough, when they were in the mother's womb. And so they are really not able to learn. And there is a large and influential view saying that. I'm sure it's important. To, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that the government of India has, under Nipun, taken on the idea that early childhood is important. It's important that children get, uh, get um, some, uh, some uh, you know, the Anganwadi system is strengthened, they get learning and, and feeding at the same time. All of this is important. But I'll give you a, a study, uh, something from a study we did. This was a study of, of vegetable and fruit sellers in markets in Kolkata and Delhi. These were all children under average age 11. They were all sellers, they were selling themselves. You go to them and say, give me 400 grams of carrots and 200 grams of peas. They calculate and tell you the amount back in seconds. You give them 200 rupees, they give you change back in another second. It's all, all done in faster than a calculator could do it. And this was, this is true in, so they get the calculation right 93% of the time. And if you mm, sort of say, no, no, that's not right, 99% of the time. They, they just get it right. They all can do it. The next thing we did was we asked them, okay, so you, you, you can do this. So then we call, call we talk to a parent and we ask them, okay, can you do the Asar math? Asar math is like 16 minus, no. Uh, 86 minus 37. I mean, they've been doing 200 minus something times something plus something some something. They say, no, if I could do that, I would be in school. They cannot. So, this, there is an amazing, so in other words, that our children, that these disadvantaged children who are working in markets, they are the children of the poorest, are fully able to do mental math as fast as me maybe faster. And they're not able, and but as soon as you show you something that comes from a school, or looks like a school math, or is written on a piece of paper, they say, no, 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 I don't know that. And they really can't do it. Our entire pedagogy is designed to intimidate. We teach to, to make children feel 
bad about themselves because they're not, you haven't learned everything that was in the curriculum which, which is dictated by some central uh, set of experts who have decided that all these children need to learn these things, even if most of them, as I told you, cannot add or subtract like the SR results show. But still, in class five, we'll teach you class five math. It doesn't matter if you can add or subtract. So by doing that, by treating you as a failure if you cannot do certain specified things, we break the confidence of the children. The, the, our education system, so in other words, and encouragingly, the converse is true. When we actually decide to teach children respectfully, say, this is what you need, uh, if you don't know this, that's not a problem, we'll teach you that. They learn very, very fast. So both sides of that is true. If you actually respect the child and say that you can learn, and here's what you need to know, I'll teach you that, they learn extremely fast. That's also results from a bunch of interventions done all over the world. In India, a lot of them by Pratham. And, and it's always the same. Can I take a couple more minutes? How many? Five more? Okay. Um, so, so, in other words, I think, again, we, by, it's easy to formulate an answer. It's easy to say, you know, eh, eh, you know peop, these kids, maybe they can't learn. And it's much, much more, I think that there's actually lots of good news in the world. Lots of good things happen if you do them. But you have to be mindful, you have to think about why they would work. And when they do, they do work. It's not that these kids cannot be taught. They can be taught. We just don't try to teach them. Let me let me uh, start with uh, end with one more example. I, I you know I, this is what I do for a living, so I bore my students with it, so I could go on for hours. But let me start end with one more. One thing that I, I told you, I'll tell you something we got very wrong in our book. There was no discussion of mental health in our book. We sort of, and I think this was the accepted prejudice, at least in the economics community, but probably a little bit beyond in the policy making community. Poor people cannot afford to be depressed because they are they have a hard life, they have to work. They, they, depression means you have to, you're lying in bed and not doing anything. We started to, now we've started to measure depression. One of the best studies of depression is in Goa. Uh, uh, Vikram Patel, who uh, has, has done these studies. Uh, my, my friend Vikram um, is, uh, is an amazing scholar and he has done many of these studies in Goa. So one of the things that those studies find is that depression, both male and female, is pervasive. We've done a study which builds on what he's done in Tamil Nadu and we find that among the elderly, the depression rates are mind-boggling. 40% are depressed. Elderly women, 40% are depressed. There really is, it's, that's catastrophic. There really, and you know, again, that clashes into one of our other myths. We, we, we live by myths and, I mean, that we have to, but some of those myths are dangerous. That you know, the family will take care of it. And I, I tell you, we have been trying, there's a government pension program for these women. Thousand rupees, nothing, nothing much. but. We cannot get the bureaucracy to agree to give it to them. They keep saying, why are you giving this money, this waste? Remember I told you before, poor, giving money to poor people is not a good thing. They, they, you shouldn't give it to them. And in particular, these women, their families will take care of them. Families don't even, don't, and now in Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu has had demographic trans, trans, transition uh, 15, 20 years ago. So they are less than two children and many of them had one child and the one child has gone off to his city and his wife doesn't like her mother-in-law and they're gone. She's, no one comes to see her. Uh, she cannot use a cell phone. We have to teach these women to use cell phones because they are, they don't, there's no one to, they have no one to call. So we try to pair them up with people they can at least call to make life a little bit less uh, tedious for them. Uh, so, again, because we, I, I, like, I want to end this on this example, because the example is very nice in saying a set of our prejudices, that the family takes care of people, poor people cannot be uh, depressed. In fact, uh, we know that this is a big problem. One of the other things that Vikram and, and my colleague Frank Schilbach and 
an, uh, another friend from Harvard, uh, Gautam Rao, have been doing is looking at the effects of um, cognitive and behavioral therapy on, on these depressed people. And you see therapy done, and one of the things they demonstrate is the therapy done by uh, a very, um, you know, m sort of lightly trained uh, uh, sort of person with no university degree can already make big difference and big difference that lasts five, de five years. So it's really, remar it's again, easy to solve problems. Not all of them, but they're many easy to solve problems. We don't solve them because we tell ourselves stories that are wrong. I think what is critical, so I think I, I wanted to, I mean, we do randomized control trials, but, and randomized control trials are ve very, very uh, kind of convincing ways to capture the evidence, but mostly, we should be uh, even more fundamental than that is to just ask questions to say well, you know what is it that you know we have all these myths about all these things why do I believe this where did that come from what convinced me of that is it just my introspection about human nature or is it there something that holds on to it and I think if we did a little bit open our eyes I think we would make, build a better world thank you Thank you, Professor. That was a very educative address. And uh, there's another myth that we writers and artists are poor. So now you know it, guys. We are poor because we are poor. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We are actually rich because we are rich. A difficult time for everyone, including us at the International Center Goa. We have had to suspend our regular physical programs last three years, including GALF. Therefore, I'm very delighted we are staging the 11th edition of the Goa Arts and Literature Festival starting today and for the next two days. Staging the 11th edition is also special because it gives us an opportunity and an appropriate platform to felicitate Sri Damodar Mauzo for his contribution to Kokni literature and for receiving the Nyan Pit Award 2022. Sri Mauzo, affectionately known as Bhai, is a Konkani lover and votary. The Kokuni is the mother tongue of Goans. It has endured many challenges to its development. During Portuguese colonial rule, its use was suppressed. It has had to reckon with the widespread use of Marathi language amongst the last section of Goan population especially in the written medium during the Portuguese era and subsequently. It is beset by many regional and societal differences, especially the use of script for its usage. Despite these impediments, Kokni has made significant progress in the last few decades. Three milestones in the growth of Kokni stand out. Its recognition as an independent literary language in 1975, granting of status of official language of Goa, and its inclusion in the 8th Schedule of the Constitution of India in 1992. This was possible because of the tireless and selfless efforts of many people who love Kokni from the bottom of their heart. One person who has made a singular and a leading contribution to the cause of Kokni is Sri Damodar Mauzo. Bhai was born in 1944 in the coastal village of Majorda. His primary education was in Marathi and Portuguese while English was his secondary language. He went to school in Margaon, passing his SSC in 1961, and subsequently got his BCom degree from the reputed R.A. Podar College of Commerce and Economics in Mumbai from Bombay University. It was during his time in Mumbai that he discovered his pension and aptitude for writing short stories in Kokni. Upon his return to Goa and to his family business, Bai began to take writing very seriously. He published Gone down, a, a collection of short stories in 1977, and there was no looking back after that. By his writing in Kokni, ranges from short stories in fiction, novels, children's books, biographies, and screenplays for films. His writing is firmly rooted in a social milieu and takes up the issue of ordinary people, whether it is the tribulations of housemates, the anger of a freedom fighter's son, 
for the guilt of a Catholic girl who has unwittingly shared beef with a Hindu friend. Reading his stories, one gets inside the skin of characters as diverse and contrasting as insiders and newcomers, children and the elderly, the middle class and the nouveau riche. Though the stories are set in a provincial frame, the relevance and import is universal. Bhai is a very gentle human being, and hence it is no surprise that social criticism in his books is weaved into the narrative with a very gentle touch. A lot of Bhai's writings focus on the human nature, whether it is greed, deceit, love, lust, prejudice, innocence, beauty, aging, and obsession. Though Bhai's writing is in Kokni, fortunately his books have been translated into various languages and in the process made his works accessible to a wider readership. Bhai has won many awards, but some are especially very significant. He won the Kokni Basha Mandal Literary Award for, in 1973 and for Zagran in 1976 and the Goa Kala Academy Literary Award in 1973 and Kani Ek Komsachi in 1978. Bhai continued going from strength to strength and larger literary institutions began to make, to take note of his impact. He won the Sahitya Academy Award in 1983 for Carmelin. Tsunami Simon, written in the aftermath of the tsunami in 1996, won the Vishwa Kogni Shrimati Vimla V. Pai Puraskar. His contribution to the Kokni films has been amply re rewarded when he received the Goa Film Festival's Best Screenplay Award for the Kokni film Alisha and was presented with the Best Dialogues Award for Shitu and O Maria. In 1985, he presided over the Akil Bharti of Kokni Sahitya Sammelan and All India Literary Conference. He has served a five-year term as a member of the Executive Board of Sahitya Academy, India's premier national-level institution dedicated to the promotion of literature in the languages of India. However, his crowning glory is undoubtedly being the recipient of the Nyan Pit Award in, 19, in 2022. The Nyan Pit Award is the oldest and the highest Indian literary award presented annually by, by the Bharatiya Nyan Pit to an author for their outstanding contribution towards literature. Instituted in 1961, the award is bestowed only on Indian writers writing in Indian languages, included in the eighth schedule of the Constitution of India and now also in English. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that the International Centre Goa is pleased to felicitate Sri Damodar Mauzo for his contribution to Konkani literature and for receiving the Nyan Award 2022. Please join me in giving us giving him a standing ovation. Burna ille vasta menti pas thodi chil la chidista sankoj dista itla khadir getting felicitation at my own festival is so embarrassing. <laughs> so you can understand how I feel. But then uh, I am really overwhelmed by this gesture from my friends, Yatin, uh, Vivek, and I don't know how many are involved in this conspiracy, I would say. <laughs> because until I arrived here, I did not know that they are going to do this felicitation act here. But anyway, I am very thankful to uh, in ICG and uh, Goa Literature Festival and all of you. Nyanipit Meyap Yer Valdini. I am Makit Tsur Ananda Sahitya to the Pravas Chala. Over the last six decades that I have been working, I have been acting, active in the field of literature. I have learned a lot of, lot of things and I am I'm still learning, of course the process is on. Uh, but uh, one thing uh, I should say, uh, Nyanapit Award made me, uh, I won't say proud as such, but I made, my, I felt um, proud of my language, which made me possible to get this award. Wow. So, a decade back or two decades back, probably no, nobody thought, I'm talk, sorry, uh, Ravindra Kayakarji, he got the award, the first one. Uh, 
by the way, I'm just bringing to your uh, notice, Ravindra Kehkar was the first essayist to get this honor, Nyanapit Award, in the history of Nyanapit. <coughs> no essayist has won the award. Uh, and uh, now, this is the second Nyanapit that has come our way. Uh, uh, I hope this will inspire younger generation, particularly the Konkani writers, to um, uh, face the challenge and arise, raise their bar and Sagitanga Fauta Miruche, I have no words to express my uh, gratitude. I thank you, thank you, Yatin, and thank you, everybody. of its release so we are very happy that we are uh, launching it here uh, at the uh, 11th edition of Gulf. Uh, friends I still uh, cannot get over Major General Ian Cardozo Zuao uh, who faced bruises uh, for uh, belonging for belongingness and for the love of the game and love of Goa. Uh, we know Uday Bab and we know how many prisons Uday Bab has faced for the same love and belongingness for a Konkani, for state of Goa and for our society. Uh, but I think Uday Bab, we, we as uh, readers and we as uh, literature enthusiasts were waiting for uh, your role as a creative writer. And uh, together with congratulating you, I must thank you for this novel and I must also thank COVID uh, which finally made it happen. Uh, many of us know that uh, the novel was ready in your hearts and minds long ago, many years ago, but uh, finally it took COVID uh, to release the uh, novel. Reba, why this delay? Uh, why we had to wait so much to uh, you know, finally read World Legger? Anvesha Bhai, you have to ask me a question. You have to ask me a question. You have to ask me a question. जब वार्डमन मानदीक सोइरे मनु नहीं ले आसार तर बैनर्जी अनेक मेजर जनरल यहाँ बाप कार्डोस अंका अत तुम का सागले मानस तांग मज़ा नमस्कार साहित्य चा अनेक कले चा मोहत समात वाट और गिरोपाची खोस वेगरी सस्ता ती को साझाओं भोक्ता अनित्य खतिर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर गोवा अनिक यहाँ मोहत सवाचे आयोजक अंक सागर अंक आऊं बड़े मार्कता अनित साहित्य चनी कलेची सेवा ये अशेष्टरेन फुरेंसल चीज आई थी वर्षा अशें मार्कता now I come to the question asked by Anvesha. The main reason is the uncharted course of my life. Till the age of 26, I wrote a play, six short stories, and about 20 lyrics. That was the time when the efforts for merger of Goa into Maharashtra began in Goa. I was working for All India Radio in Bombay. I left Bombay, came to Goa, joined the Rashtramat Daily, the Marathi Daily newspaper, which was specially uh, brought out to, to oppose merger and to propagate the cause of Kokadi. Thereafter, there was the opinion poll and one agitation followed the other agitation. I got involved into all these agitations, headed many institutions and could not get time even to write a short story, leave aside any novel. I could write only a few lyrics, that's all. My profession of practice of law also did not help. That did not give me time enough to write a novel. But I kept reading and taking notes. 
at the age of 70, I saw that either I have to continue with my profession or I have to stop it to write whatever I desired to write. And it took me about three, four years to complete whatever work that was in my hand as a lawyer. And in seven, at the age of 75, I decided, I closed down my office and decided to write whatever I wanted to write. Suddenly, an invitation came from Goa University. They wanted me to be a chair professor of B.B. Borker Chair for Comparative Literature and to teach in the Kokhani department. I couldn't say no. Normally, teachers, if I'm not mistaken, retire at the age of 60. I became a teacher at the age of 75. Wow. And I spent four years in Goa University. So, it was 79. In the 80th year, I planned the novel and wrote it in the 81st year of my life. That is the exact reason why it was so late. Otherwise, I had started to read and study the subject about 20 years back. It was all open in my head, but there was no time to write it up. And I can't write with the several distractions of this type or that type. <coughs> and as Anmesha said rightly, COVID helped me be there. COVID gave us a lot of trouble, but as far as this novel is concerned, it helped me. Rebab, we are uh, thankful to you for your selfless journey that has finally uh, brought you to this novel. Uh, but why this topic of Inquisition? We know this uh, novel is based on the dark period of Inquisition. Why did you think of this topic and wrote this novel on this topic? It was not deliberate. History is my favorite subject. And if it is gone history, definitely I am interested in every part of it. As I said, about 20 years back, I read a book on Inquisition. That aroused curiosity in my mind. And over a period of 20 years, I went on acquiring books on that subject and on the related subject. All books are not only Inquisition, but some are related to that subject or to that period of history. And then I thought that Goans should know their history. I saw that many people were not aware of this history because it is in the books of history and very few people read history books. Then there was an option before me. Either I write it, a book of history in Kokhani, because most of the books are in English only, not even in Marathi. Either I write it as history, or I give it in the capsule as, a, as fiction. And my experience has been that people reading books of history are less than those who read fiction. So if I present history through fiction, I thought it would reach a wider readership. And therefore, I thought of this novel. But I put some rules for me. I made it a point to ensure that history should not be distorted or exaggerated in any manner at all while I'm dealing with history. I should stick to the historical part of it 
and not the imaginary part of it. Secondly, I should also stick to geography. It may appear odd to you that I am referring to geography here. But I will tell you an instance why I am saying it. There is a book on the same period in English, there is a novel in English, Guardian of the Dawn. The writer, I forget his name, I am sorry, picks up subjects where Jews have been persecuted. And here in this period, there were Jews in Goa who were persecuted by Inquisition. So he has written a novel about it. And in the introduction he says, I have not seen Goa at all. I have not visited Goa at any time. Because if I visit today's Goa, I will not be able to imagine what was Goa 500 years back. So what I did, from the description which is given in the books, I selected a place in Philippines. I went there and stayed and wrote the book there on Goa. So therefore, in that book, Benauli is not in Salsip, outside Salsip. Therefore, uh, such, 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 such things uh, distort geography also. But I have stuck to geography and I have stuck to history without distorting it in any manner. Well, I'm glad that you wrote the novel because I never enjoyed my history textbooks back in school as much as I enjoyed uh, reading your novel. Uh, but Udeva, uh, do you think is it important to dig into history? We most often hear, uh, you know, uh, things like why do we need to go back to history? Why do mainly modi kira gusto apmanta tamhi kogni? So, uh, do you think is there a need to you know, go back to history, dig into our history? History, to my mind, is an important subject, which every child, every person should study or at least read. And perhaps that is the reason why history is being taught from high school to the postgraduate level. There are doctorates in history. History is a great teacher. I found many answers in this history to the present day questions, the present day problems. One can draw lessons from this history. Therefore, knowing history is absolutely important for any person in the world as far as I am concerned. To give an instance, this novel focuses on religious fanaticism. We in India today are also experience religious fanaticism. Sometimes it is called religious fundamentalism, whatever you call it. And there we learn lessons, what are the consequences of such religious fanaticism. How families meet with tragic ends. How people get displaced. How families get disintegrated. Here, here are lessons which, were, which, which uh, uh, we can learn uh, from history of 500 years ago. Yet, we are repeating the same mistakes. If we were wiser, we could have drawn lessons from this history and avoided such things. But because we do not know that history, we are repeating the same history. And in order that one should not repeat the history which is uh, 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 not good for us, it is necessary to know history. That is the very purpose of writing this and writing it as a novel. 
indeed uh, urabab uh, we have seen the amount of books that that are there at your place today uh, in particularly with regards to this topic and the amount of research that you have done over uh, last many years uh, are there any takeaways are there any uh, new findings that you uh, got in your journey of research in your journey of reading for this novel in particular well i should confess i am not a researcher <clears throat> I read almost every book that I could acquire. Some books were not available. I had to go to the central library and read them. But I did so because writers also differ on many points. There are different kinds of interpretations. All historians do not uh, uh, agree on uh, every issue. every historian has got his own uh, interpretation therefore i read history written by historians books written by historians i read books written by jesuit historians books written by jesuit fathers books written by uh, others in the uh, there are surprisingly uh, authors from different countries have uh, written books on this subject so after reading all these books you can come to a conclusion as to what is the truth by reading one book perhaps you can be misled and that will be distortion of history so in order to know the truth you read all the books that are available on that subject and then come to a conclusion that this is the truth and only to find the truth because i didn't want to distort the truth at all absolutely i didn't have any new findings as such because as i said i was not doing it as a research i was trying to get information an information which has support in in the books of history and which is truthful and 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 i i i will say it's not findings but i got a lot of information which i avoided to compress into this novel because writers somehow sometimes uh, are tempted to put every information that he has and there are many uh, interesting instances also that require to be written but to compress them into one book would lead to a mahabharat or a ramayan <coughs> with with things un um, unrelated to the main uh, issue or the main story i didn't want to do that therefore i focused on one particular plot or story and avoided all of the things which can be written separately as i said somewhere there can be a series of novels on this period the period between 1510 and 1770 is such a dramatic period in goa's history that a series of novels can be written now at this age i i i cannot venture to do that but someone can do that some younger writer can can uh, do this and it is possible one of our writers from mangalore we late vjp sardana wrote seven novels on captivity of mangalorean christians by tipu sultan and he wrote five books on goas persecution by the portuguese so some younger writer should take up this challenge and go ahead and briefly to answer your question there is no new finding as such but there is lot of more information than what is to be found in this novel which can be used in various ways 
thank you, Udaybab. Uh, Udaybab, there would be many readers uh, in the audience who would be looking forward to uh, translations of this novel in other languages. Do we see that in near future? Translation in Kannada language is already published. I was hoping against hope to bring the English translation today, but that was not possible. It may be available next month or in March. The uh, translation in Marathi is in the press, but may take a couple of months to be released. No, there is, there is no other effort to translate in. Uh, someone, someone suggested to me that he would translate it into Telugu, but I don't know whether he has taken it seriously. Uh, Udaybab, we hope we get to read these translations very soon. Uh, Udaybab, uh, like you said earlier, you couldn't write much uh, in your journey of uh, maybe Konkani agitations or uh, your organizational work. But uh, are there any repents for not being able to write uh, especially creative literature? Uh, well, I would have liked to write more, but there are no regrets for this reason that I didn't waste my time. I did what Goa needed at a particular time. I campaigned for the victory of opinion poll, spent five years there, when my education was incomplete. Then I spent some years in the official language agitation. I am happy because we won the opinion poll and I was a worker there. I am happy that we have the official language act and I was again a small worker in the, in the whole agitation. Then we got the statehood in 1987. And, and the inclusion of Kokni in the 8th schedule of the Constitution. In the meantime, I was also instrumental to, to work for the uh, recognition of Sahit Academy, uh, uh, by Sahit Academy of Kokni as an independent literary language. So I have the satisfaction for working for Kokni and Goa. Well, that has its consequences. I could not write more than what I did. But there is still <coughs> an urge to write. And soon after I finished writing this novel, I wrote another novel on the life of Abbe Faria. Now here again is a problem. If I mention Abbe Faria, there will be many goans, I am sure, who will ask me, who is Abe Faria? Some people consider him to be a Portuguese man. If you go to the class in the university and ask, do you know who is Abe Faria? There won't be a single hand coming up. That is the situation today. This great man who is, uh, who is recognized by the whole world as the father of the doctrine of suggestion in hypnotism is not known to most boys. That's, that's a tragedy. We have his uh, statue at a central place near the uh, Adil Shah Palace in Panjim. Many have not seen it. And, and some of those who have seen it do not know who Abhe Faria is. A son of the soil who goes to Paris, spends his life in Paris and becomes the father of the doctrine of suggestion in hypnotism which is used by uh, psychiatrists and others today. He went to many trials and tribulations unless one reads his biographies. 
it is difficult to know how much he suffered, how much he was humiliated, and and uh, uh, died a pauper in Paris. Recognition came later after his death. So he was recognized posthumously. But then unless we know our own great men, there is no sense in saying that we are proud to be Goans. If we do not know our elders who have achieved a lot, who have given to, to the world something, then that pride becomes hollow. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary to know our history and to know also the goals. Who contributed something very important to the world? And, and, and it's not only Abhay Pariya, there are many others. But unless we know about them, it's very difficult to know what kind of people Goa produced, a small Goa produced so much. I remember Nehru's words. After the liberation of Goa, Chandrakant Keni, wrote to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, thanking him, thanking him for sending the army to liberate Goa. And Nehru responded by a letter. And in that letter he says, I'm surprised. Goa is a small territory. And this, such a small territory produced so many freedom fighters. Now he is not definitely exaggerating. He, he, he is a man who moved from Kashmir to Kanyakumari during the independence movement. He knew how people came into the freedom struggle. He remarks there that I am surprised that such a small territory could produce so many freedom fighters, those who, who sacrificed uh, so much for liberation of Goa. Similarly, there are others who worked in other fields of life and it's necessary that we should know them to be proud of them and their achievements. <laughs>